I'm going to talk uh, essentially about two things in this presentation. Um, one, I thought that I would... Uh, it's okay, I've got one. I've got one. No, uh, I can fix you up this one. It works like this. You uh, take this one off, and that turns it on. Oh, oops. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to point out um, some of what I think, I guess, are unique numerical aspects that come up in tsunami modeling. They, they come up in similar problems as well. Um, but uh, there are a lot of aspects to numerically modeling tsunamis with different methods that might come up in all uh, applications that one that would use that method on. And, um, but here I'm trying to focus on some unique numerical aspects and in particular point out um, things that might be of use to people that are experienced uh, numerical analysts, experienced scientific and uh, scientific computation, but maybe new, getting uh, into tsunami modeling and new to that. So I'll give a flavor. And some of these unique numerical aspects might only pertain to finite volume methods, uh, Godinov type finite volume methods. I, I don't really know um, uh, the, the extent or how broad these issues are. But I know they're focused on by people that use Godinov finite volume methods. Um, so I haven't had a chance yet to acknowledge any collaborators. So since this is my last talk, I thought I'd quickly do that. Uh, Randy Levesque, I think you all know is the one. He was uh, my advisor and Donna's advisor. Uh, and uh, he created Clawpack. Marsha Berger originally developed adaptive mesh refinement methods patch-based for hyperbolic uh, conservation laws, and those are the ones that have been extended to tsunami modeling, uh, but they were developed more generally long ago. Uh, Kyle Manley, Donna, who's here, other, other people that were worked with Randy, um, and people that are now uh, using GeoClaw and, and uh, extending it to GPUs and stuff like that. I don't know how far that's come, but... Uh, and then the other thing I'm going to talk about today at the, the last half is modeling two-phase granular fluid flows. And I do that with, with people at the USGS, uh, Dick Iverson and, and Roger Dindlinger, among others. Uh, they're, they're more uh, physicists who understand the, the physics and the modeling more than I do. And I tend to focus more on the, uh, the model equations and the numerics. Um, so some of the unique... Uh, numerical issues that I'll point out uh, are, is first this issue of well balancing for ocean propagation. Uh, another problem that comes up is the depth positivity problem or the wet dry uh, wet dry boundary interface. Um, there are potentially shoreline instabilities I call them that's that's related to this but not not entirely captured by dealing with this depth positivity issue. Uh, and there are also ill-posedness and instabilities for, for a lot of these depth averaged models uh, d depending on your parameter. Um, for, for most problems in geophysics or, or many problems, large subsets of the parameter space, the problem's ill-posed and there's various types of instabilities that, that people should be aware of. Um, for instance, shallow water equations have something known as the resonance phenomenon. It's an instability in the regular shallow water equations with bathymetry. Uh, and also things like roll waves where when you have friction down slopes, uh, that's a type of instability where uh, steady flow develops these roll waves. <coughs> they're basically what they sound like. Um, and those are observed in physical systems. I mean, they're, they're actually observed in the real systems as well, but they appear in the equations as, as a type of instability. Uh, and then I'll get into granular fluid flows, modeling multiphase, uh, what are what I call non-rheological flows. Um, these are complex mixtures of fluids and grains where it's very difficult to use a single type of rheology to model that. Uh, so there's a, many people in, in granular flows have now abandoned looking for a true rheological or, you know, a rheological model to treat this as a single fluid in favor of more complicated models that are, that are, don't have a single rheology. And then uh, maybe I'll suggest ways that maybe these, these models for landslides can be coupled with tsunamis. Okay, so this, this issue of well balancing, and, and uh, Elong talked about this in the uh, uh, rapid fire talks, or I forgot what they were called. Um, so well balancing has to do with numerically maintaining a particular steady state, and uh, usually one that's prevalent in your problem, or you wouldn't care so much about it. Um, and it's required to resolve small perturbations to those steady states. So if you think about it, that makes sense. If you can't if you can't maintain the steady state, 
and you have numerical error uh, deviating from that steady state, then it would be difficult to, to resolve small perturbations to that steady state. Um, and this is a problem with shallow water equations over bathymetry that's been studied and known a long time. Um, but it's, in many contexts, different applications. But it's particularly relevant for tsunami modeling um, because if you consider a tsunami, and I've shown this figure before, this is the 2010 tsunami, um, this literally is this simulation. It's just obviously different scales. The depth of the ocean here is thousands of meters. Um, the bathymetry is varying relatively rapidly compared to the wave here, and the wave is only 20 centimeters high uh, and long wavelength. So we've talked about, I've talked about this before and others have. That means you can think of tsunamis as this tiny perturbation to this steady state. Um, so to resolve that perturbation using the, these types of methods requires well-balanced methods. And well-balancing is, is not an issue uh, regarding order of accuracy or convergence. You can have a high order method, any method that converges, um, but it may not be well-balanced. And the well-balancing property should be satisfied on coarse grids. So in other words, you can have a good method that's convergent and refine it, and eventually it'll maintain the steady state, but it won't maintain the steady state on the practical grids that you're going to use for the problem. Uh, so, so where does this... Um, so if we consider the shallow water equations here, this balance here, if we think of this as a steady state with no waves, comes from a balance of the pressure gradient here, which is assumed hydrostatic, and the bathymetry gradient. Uh, so you want to notice it's the, it's the gradient, essentially, and the pressure and the gradient in the bottom that are balanced. So we can essentially consider the 1D case and, and understand it. Uh, so in 1D, balance of this term and this term is the, the steady state balance. All these other terms are zero. So if you think about that generally, if we write the shallow water equations as this system, uh, writing compactly, the, the flow dynamics that we're looking at are a small deviation to the balance between this term and this term. So this comes from the pressure gradient, bathymetry. These two terms can be quite large in magnitude if you consider the scales here. So the bathymetry <coughs> gradient and the depth gradient and the depth gradient are quite large compared to the the, the background gradient in the solution that's not part of that steady state. So in other words, these two terms are large in magnitude, and this term is small in magnitude compared to these, but, but this, these are the dynamics we're trying to model. Okay. Yep? Jane, you get that last part. So the, the gradient of the perturbation is also comparable in scale with the gradient of the uh, uh, So if, if, if you look, let's see. You know, the, this term and this term are quite large, but they're counterbalanced. And the difference between them is what gives you these terms, but that's what you're trying to model. So it's this small perturbation from this background steady state that has fairly large terms. Right, so these, these two terms need to cancel, essentially, to get this, this term that's smaller. Um, so... You know, this, this issue comes up in, in lots of problems, uh, but I think tsunami modeling is actually one of the best examples, um, and it's actually one of the ones used by people that work on well-balanced methods, even for other applications, because it really, it's really an extreme case for this. Uh, so applications with delicate balanced steady states, so balanced because the steady state involves terms that are counterbalanced but large, require specialized methods. And th this, as I was saying at the beginning, this pertains to this class of conservative methods um, where, and it tends to come up with any methods that are shock capturing, or, or most methods, I guess, that are shock capturing. One can rewrite the shallow water equations in terms of the surface elevation rather than the depth and the, the velocity rather than the momentum, and that largely gets rid of this problem I, as, far as, I, as far as I know. Um, but then one can't use those methods for shock capturing. So... It's just a, one of the things one has to deal with in using the equations in conservative form where we can do shock capturing. One has to deal with this well-balanced property. One, you could presumably switch methods or you could use a well-balanced method. So our approach in 
many people's approach is to just use a well-balanced method. Um, so a numerical scheme is well-balanced if it exactly preserves a discontinuous steady state weak solution. So let's say this is a steady state, the motionless water at rest. <coughs> this is our, our generalized solution in a sense. It's discontinuous, um, like um, constant in each grid cell if it's our numerical solution. And this is an exact solution uh, to this problem. And a numerical scheme should preserve that exactly if it's well balanced. Uh, this would be a flowing steady state. So this doesn't seem like a steady state solution to the shallow water equations, but it actually is if you think about, um, or at least it's a, a cartoon of one. Um, if you think about flowing water in a river or something, it might look like this where the surface varies, the flow's moving, but it's a steady state. It's not, it's a, it's not changing in time. So uh, particular well-balanced schemes are usually designed to, sat to, to uh, exactly preserve a prevalent steady state. So most well-bound schemes are designed to preserve this. They may not exactly preserve that. Um, okay, so, so getting back to this, this, this steady state problem is a balance of these terms. Uh, the dis, discret, discretized version. So if you think about solving Riemann problems for this, or for the ocean at rest, they might look like this. Uh, this is probably exaggerated, this jump in bathymetry, given the depths. Um, but you can imagine you can have a fairly large jump in bathymetry between adjacent cells when you have grid cells that are 160 kilometers in size, like the, the uh, Pacific Ocean tsunami simulations I showed. So, so typically, how would one solve using these, these Godinov finite volume methods, meaning these finite volume methods that use Riemann solvers? How would one solve this non-homogeneous conservation law? Well, uh, the typical approach is to use uh, what's known as a fractional step method, where you essentially solve the homogeneous problem first. So we solve this um, up to some intermediate solution, uh, where methods have been designed for this type of system for a long time. So we solve that Riemann problem for that system. So if you think about it, if we removed the source term, well, that's where the information about the bathymetry is contained. It's, it's in the source term on the right-hand side. So if we solve this set of equations, we're solving this, the two depths, right? Because we're solving for the conserved variables. So, you know, this is the surface elevation that's constant, but the depths are the only thing on the left-hand side. So if we solve this Riemann problem, we get large waves. And then... Uh, after we solve that Riemann problem, we use that to update the solution. But notice what, what the, what's happened to the depth. If I consider the bathymetry, I've, I have a huge error here. But that's because we haven't considered the source term yet. So in a separate step, one solves this set of ODEs to go from the intermediate solution to the, the, the final solution at time t n plus 1. So we're solving a set of ODEs with some totally different method to undo what we just did. Because those ter two terms this and this balance, but or nearly balanced, but we've split them into totally different integration steps. So it's, it's pretty intuitive. You can see that the, the numerical errors cause, uh, prevent the precise cancellation of those terms. So this is just an example of how a traditional method is not well balanced. Um, so I don't know, briefly, I'll just go through this. The, the way, uh, uh, so the, the methods in GeoClar are one type of well balanced scheme. And the way the steady states are preserved is we redefine, uh, we rewrite the shallow water equations like this as a homogeneous system. But this is no longer a flux or the gradient of a flux. It's known as a non-conservative product because we can't write this as the gradient of a single vector. Uh, and this W is the normal shallow water, uh, H, HU, the regular variables, the momentum flux, and the, the bottom bathymetry becomes like a solution variable. Uh, so if you do that and you consider the, this actually as one of your variables, you can rewrite them like this. If you consider a steady state, these are the equations. If it's steady and this is zero, then it must satisfy this. Well, W is certainly varying in space because we have variable bathymetry. So that implies that W then um, is an eigenvector of this matrix here, 
and it must have eigenvalue zero. So you can think of the bathymetry as a solution variable with characteristics that aren't moving. Um, so the way the steady states are preserved is that if, if you, I know this is maybe not familiar to some of you, but uh, for those that have studied these hyperbolic problems some, and I think Don will talk about uh, Riemann solutions a little more. Um, for this particular system, it turns out that your a steady state solution connecting two steady states as you move through space, uh, they must be an integral curve of this particular field, the eigenvector related to this zero eigenvalue. So numerically what you want to do is if your left and right states of a Riemann problem lie on one of these integral curves, you want your Riemann solution to essentially connect those. So in other words, if you have a discontinuous solution that's uh, if you have a discontinuous solution where the two left and right states lie on that integral curve, such as a motionless steady state, you, you wouldn't want any waves arising in your Riemann problem. Um, same with if you have a flowing steady state, there would be a jump here, but if these two states lie on, an in, on the steady state integral curve, you wouldn't want any waves in the Riemann solution. And if you're not at a steady state, you want the waves just to be deviations. So essentially, notice what we've done is... is uh, by incorporating the bottom bathymetry here, we're now solving a Riemann problem that takes into account the source term or the variable bathymetry. And that's how uh, these methods are well-balanced. That's how they achieve well-balancing. Okay. So moving on to uh, shorelines. Kind of lost track of a watch or something. Okay. Uh, so another difficulty that comes up, which is somewhat related to this well-balancing, and um, in some ways, and that's, that's where h goes to zero uh, at the shoreline. And determining the motion of the shoreline can be difficult, but that's, if you're doing inundation modeling at least, that's the, the main area you're interested in, and that's where the equations pre present problems and the numerics present problems. Um, in fact, right at the edge, where h goes to zero, the, the, the equations are, are ill-posed right there. Um, so often, Ad hoc approaches are used based on some sort of physical argument, but that's often prone to numerical instabilities. Um, it turns out that you can solve the Riemann problem between a wet and dry state exactly, but not in the case where there's bathymetry. So what does one do? If you, if you consider uh, the steady state at the shoreline, this is what the Riemann problem would look like if, let's say, this is just stationary flow. Remember that our, our equations have this term uh, db dx. And so if you were discretizing that in some fashion, you would use the left and right state of b. But if you think about it, this water is motionless. This value has to be physically meaningless because uh, there, there's no way for information about how high this cliff is to be in the equations. So you can't discretize the equations in the normal fashion you do on the rest of the domain here at the edge, right? Because if you'd have too high of a value of B here, it would push the water out. And in fact, when we first started um, modeling tsunamis, that's the first thing we noticed before we were experienced with these types of things. Is, and I'm sure anyone that had been modeling tsunamis before could have told us, but we hadn't thought about it. And we set up problems at the scale of an ocean basin. Didn't think anything was happening. We thought it was working but then realized to zoom in at the scale of tsunami waves compared to the ocean depth, you know, we had a depth that, uh, non-dimensional of one or something. And then we realized, well, the tsunami waves would be, you know, a thousandth of that. Um, then when we zoomed in, we realized there were massive waves coming from the edge, and then we learned in the literature that, you know, it's, it's obvious when you think about it, but it's easy to overlook. Uh, so what value, if you have a steady state, would you need in the shallow water equations to maintain uh, you know, no waves here, you'd need the value right to be the same as the water level. And you can show that pretty simply just doing a, a, a finite difference discretization right at the shore. You know, it's pretty obvious that, that B needs to be the same as this level here. So one could do that, but what happens then if there's a little bit of velocity here and your source term is based on this value here? Well, then you wouldn't have enough a large, your source term would no longer be physical then because it would easily inundate into this cell because it thinks it's the same height. Um, so there are, you know, it's possible to use this method and there's some, there, I guess they can be stable. 
but you would you wouldn't be able to converge to accurate uh, run up on a shoreline, let's say. Uh, so what's done in GeoClaw is somewhat ad hoc, but it, it seems to work well and it seems to be stable. Um, what we do is if if the velocity is insufficient to inundate the cell, the Riemann solution looks like this, and we simply retain these waves moving back into the cell as an update. And the way this is determined is by simply solving a wall boundary condition there. Which in this discretized sense is in some sense what's happening. You're slamming into a wall right there. Uh, now if there's, let's say there's more velocity that's sufficient to overtop this hill, we solve the wall boundary condition. We determine that you can determine from the wall boundary condition how high this, this, this double shock solution is. If it's higher than this level, then we uh, just use the value bi over here and solve the equations with a typical discretization like that. So you get a larger source term. You're not having to reduce the source term at the edge when there would be inundation. So it's somewhat ad hoc, but it, I think it's physically based. Um, so I just put this back up to keep in mind, if you don't take into consideration these types of effects, then you, then you don't get very good solutions when, you're, when topography plays a very strong role in your problem. So in these type of steep flows, uh, you can imagine if you weren't treating shorelines well, you could get large errors, and some methods do suffer from um, what's called a sloshing effect, where you always see sloshing at the boundaries, and you can see that in some tsunami simulations too. If you look closely at the shoreline, you'll see it looks like the water's boiling, and that's essentially an instability at the shoreline. So. No, I think that's physical. <laughs> I mean, I do actually. It's it it comes off here and it flows up here and and but yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that that our methods are. I I, I think that slashing that's really prevalent right there is is physical, or at least it's shallow water equation solutions. I'll play it one more time. I've just stared at it enough times. <laughs> no, I, I I don't think I'm. I mean, I don't think I'm full of baloney on this one. I think that is a, a true sloshing based on physics. How good, you know, and the shallow water equations work fairly well for for this. So I think that's just a physical sloshing. But I, but yeah, don't get me wrong. There, I can crash GeoClaw by you know always be aware that most of these codes can crash. You can develop instability. So. Yeah. <laughs> I won't show that again. Okay, so moving on, uh, switching gears here entirely. Um, I guess I didn't get around to making slides on the the resonance problem and the roll wave problem, but those aren't huge issues. I just thought they would might be interesting. But if you're interested in those, you can talk to me after. Um, so moving on to granular fluid flows, uh, we model a class of flows which which generally might be called debris flows. Geophysicists sometimes use this very for very specific type of flow, um, but the, the range of flows we call debris flows includes landslides, mudslides, lahars, uh, basically liquefied masses of soil and rock. And the, for these debris flows, this was in 2006 outside of Portland um, off Mount Hood. You can see here how large these liquefied uh, solids can be. And th they truly can become neutrally buoyant in these flows. Maybe not, maybe not these ones, but fairly large particles. <laughs> So I'll show one. Sorry, I have two phones. I forgot oh, to turn them off. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and that's recorded there. My apologies for <laughs> the <posterity. laughs> Um. Okay, so yeah, this just just these are kind of interesting, but I don't know how useful it is to watch these, but they're still. I'll turn it up for the. So the, the thing to watch here, I mean, the interesting thing here is watch as it goes by how large the particles are. <laughs> yeah, whoever's filming this has got some guts. Yeah, I don't think there's enough energy in this to kill you, but it would certainly hurt. I'm, ki I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm too good. Yeah, no, watch the as it goes by, I mean massive boulders. I'd probably tell you.
Uh, that was in uh, Indonesia. That's a lahar from, uh, near a, a volcano. I, I don't know. I don't know the, the names too well. <laughs> yeah, it's essentially what these debris flows are. They're, they're actually very common in certain parts of the world. Um, they can begin as what you might think of as a regular landslide, and then somehow they entrain water, either it be from running into a stream, or it could just be uh, literally from very saturated earth. And then that water plays a strong role. It, it essentially liquefies the solid. So they're, they're, they're kind of like a landslide, but it's behaving like a... A fluid, dies, essentially. Dies yeah, that and that's that's exactly the uh, maybe that's the essence of these is that they can behave like a deforming solid, or they can behave like a literally a, a fluid, um, and everything in between, essentially. So that's why they're very difficult to model. I think maybe the next slides have uh, kind of forgot what I have on the next slides, but. Um, that's why they're very difficult to model with a single rheology. So you can, for, for many years, people tried to come up with, you know, what's the true rheology of these flows. But any time you have a fixed rheology, you won't be able to capture that transition from, uh, you know, you can't have the right friction that would allow you to transfer from something that's behaving like a deforming solid to a fluid. Um, so briefly, this is, this is a slide about debris flow mobilization or landslide mobilization. What happens? How does a landslide get started? Uh, so our model is a series of depth average equations. Of course, you know, that's just a model. But, but in terms of the depth average equations, the way to think about it is that failure occurs. Uh, so you have this, this uh, mass that's not flat like water. That, so obviously there's some sort of driving force, but the, the shear strength's enough to hold it there. But failure occurs when the driving forces slightly exceed the shear strength at some point. So that has to happen uh, unless there's some sort of external forcing. That has to happen continuously in a sense. It fails at, at one spot because it was stable before that. Um, so essentially a small perturbation to a balanced steady state is what causes the failure. And then what happens from there depends on a, on a, a feedback process. So the equilibrium is perturb, perturbed. What happens next depends on the state of the material in a sense. So you can have a rapid temporary instability where you have this sheer contraction as the, the material fails and begins to deform. Uh, that leads to increased pore pressure because the grains are coming closer together. Um, it's, not as, it's consolidation. So that higher pressure decreases the shear strength. So it's somewhat counterintuitive. The particles are actually contracting and that's what's leading to uh, them being more buoyant or in less shear strength. Less shear strength. That then can lead to a large landslide or debris flow. Uh, the alternative, or the, the, the flip side of that, is if initially you have a shear dilation, which decreases the pore pressure. So in other words, shear causes the grains to move apart. Um, shear strength is reestablished, and you get these slumps. And you can see that those are common, too, where you have the material just slumps and then stabilizes. And you can sort of have anything in between, such as stick slip type flows. So if, if, if this feedback here is the important, or one of the, it's an important stage that, uh, determines the transition or if there's a transition from stability to a debris flow. If you're to capture that, uh, at, at least using this form of equation and the type of numerical methods we use, we, it at least requires well-balanced methods because it's this small perturbation and feedback between this balanced steady state that, that we need to capture. Um, so one of the issues is, is numerical. Well, this was a slide I had for a presentation that was more detailed, but uh, one needs to conserve numerically the fluxes here. We also have non-conservative products, and they must also be well-balanced. Uh, so the model we use is essentially a two-phase model. It's depth averaged. Uh, if you look at, these are the equations we solve. You might look at this and say, well, that's not two-phased. We have depth, <coughs> velocities, solid volume fraction, and poor fluid pressure. So it's, in some, some ways, uh, it's, not too, it's a quasi-two-phase model in a sense, because we're only tracking the uh, uh, velocities of one phase. Um, either you could, it, it's actually, it can either be the solid phase or you can assume the two phases are moving at the same, uh, same rate. And for these types of debris flows, that's a fairly safe assumption that the differences in the velocities of the solid particles and the fluids in a depth average sense is small. But the main feedback is between changes in the solid volume fraction and the pore fluid pressure. It's that feedback that happens upon dilation or contraction that is the main way in which the pressure feeds back on the, uh, uh, 
Well, the solid volume fraction feeds into the pore fluid pressure, which affects the friction and the shear stress. There are, there are true two-phase models which track independently the solid grains and the fluid, but often they have a, they have a pore fluid pressure that, that is not coupled between the dilation. So they might be truly two-phase, but the pressure isn't playing its, its predominant role. Um, well, often the pressure is just assumed to be hydrostatic or satisfies a diffusion equation or something. The, the, I'm kind of belaboring this a little too much, but the problem with two-phase models in this depth average sense where you track independent velocity phases is that they lose hyperbolicity, so they're, they're uh, unstable often in at least certain <coughs> regimes. Okay. Um, yeah, some of these were for a, a more detailed lecture on this, but our equations are one of these hyperbolic systems. Uh, it looks like this, and it's strictly hyperbolic. Uh, so, uh, I don't want to belabor this too much, but, but uh, you know, this is showing dilation of the solid grains and contraction. Uh, affects the pore pressure. The pore pressure mediates, a, we use Coulomb solid stress, a very simple stress model. It's just that the pressure feeds back into it. Um, it turns out that, that our model for this dilation, contraction, and how it affects the pore fluid pressure and the volume fraction is based on this idea of a dilatancy angle, which is borrowed from, from uh, granular mechanics and, and soil mechanics, where it's used a lot. Uh, but it's been extended to, to rapid flows. Uh, so I think I went through this verbally, but these two cases of what, what happens once you have an uh, initial rise in pore pressure, which perturbs the stability. Uh, so, how do we test this model? And and I just keep in mind these these models for debris flows we know are crude. I mean, they're they're very it's a very crude type of modeling. I mean, this isn't quantum mechanics. It's it's a uh, you know we know that there are very complex physics going on that we can't capture. But the depth average models, much like in tsunami modeling and field and uh, similar fields, uh, people have gone to these depth average models for these problems because they do tend to reproduce the results fairly well. Uh, so. Uh, the way we test these models is not only by looking at real debris flows, but we have a large scale, or the USGS has a large scale debris flow flume that's heavily instrumented. Uh, so they're uh, reproduce, reproducible experiments where the pore pressure can be measured accurately um, and other, other variables, shear stresses and things like that. The idea behind these is really to understand the, the physics of granular fluid mixtures more than, the, you know, it's... It's not so much looking at the run out and trying to capture that, but more to understand the granular fluid mechanics as debris flows fail. So there are primarily two types of... Um, am I okay on time? I'll, I'll hurry up here. But there, About 20 minutes. Oh, okay. There are uh, essentially two types of experiments we do with the flume. One is a mobilization experiment where we pile sediment up here in a hopper and then in a controlled manner slowly raise the pore pressure and then see what happens as as it begins to fail when the pore pressure reaches some threshold. So you can measure the changes in the volume, fall, solid volume fraction and the pore pressure with instruments. Uh, I don't really understand those instruments so well. but So this has been sitting there for several hours as the pore pressure is very slowly raised. Oh. And then it suddenly goes. And if you were to look at the evolution of those variables, it essentially follows what I was describing, where you initially see a shear contraction, rising pore pressure. That propagates out um, in a feedback process throughout the flow, and then it, it fails. <laughs> it's yeah, it's kind of it's it's funny business. Uh, so here's a geoclass simulation, a uh, geoclass or uh, the debris flow model's in GeoClaw, but it's, it's not really available yet. Let's put it that way. Uh, here's a simulation of that last experiment. Um, it's, so there's actually a ramp. You couldn't really see in that video too well in front of this, this material back here. So what happens in this simulation is we just slowly rise the pore pressure and then see what happens once it reaches uh, uh, failure. And I've color-coded the pore pressure. Uh, so it looks white here, except for the grid lines and... It's a little tri tricky to see in this. I didn't get these quite as good as I wanted to, but it becomes green as the green to blue as the pressure increases. Um, so you can kind of see the pore pressure increasing, and then it fails in the back and liquefies as it shears over that this front here. 
Um, it turns out, and I don't have the simulation to show it, but there's only you can change one small parameter, and that's the initial solid volume fraction uh, b between above and below what's known as the critical solid volume fraction, and that solid, that range is about 0.02, and as you cross it between uh, this this critical solid volume fraction, you're essentially going from a material that wants to dilate uh, to one that wants to contract, and that changes whether it fails at all. So in the case where it wants to dilate, uh, this everything else exactly the same. This mass slumps and then stays stays put. So it's somewhat of a it's it's a it's interesting. It's somewhat unstable in some sense, I guess. It, it's a you know difficult to model. A small change in your initial parameters can can dramatically affect the outcome. Um, this is the same uh, numerical simulation. Side view, you'll see the the uh, pore pressure rising as uh, the way it's shown in this is by shading this depth blue. So if it's shaded all the way to the top blue, that means the material is is actually completely liquefied or the, the grains are neutrally buoyant. And that's actually what happens in the experiments. So you can, I'll play it one more time, it moves a little fast. So it rises and then suddenly fails and that propagates outward. But consider trying to do something like this with a with a single rheology. I mean, the material is either going to fail or it's not right from the start. There's no, you know, it's either out of balance or in balance, and it'll either be it'll either stay in balance or be at, uh, way out of balance right from the beginning. Uh, so here's here's uh, some time series. This is the pore fluid pressure in terms of head uh, for the uh, experiment that I showed and the numerical solution so it's it's uh, these are two different this here represents fully liquefied uh, so the the pressure increases uh, to liquefaction and then decreases as it flows over the ramp this these are two different experiments blue and gr or two different numerical simulations blue and green this blue one looks better because it collapses to zero here but I actually think the green one is the correct one as far as I think this might be a coincidence and an instability, actually, um, uh, even though it reproduces the experimental results really well. Uh, these are just, th these curves have been shifted in time because it's a little difficult to know exactly when failure happens in the, in the flume experiment, but to at least try to calibrate that shifting or at least uh, account for it rather than just trying to fit these curves as well. These are the displacements in a Lagrangian sense of particles uh, in that uh, failing mass in the experiment in the model. So in other words, we shifted these to fit these, which gives a similar fit here. I'll just, I'm essentially done, but we also have gate release experiments where uh, the material is saturated behind gate doors and then the gates are opened and, and the landslide starts instantaneously. That's more traditionally the way, that's more similar to traditional numerical models where you always start way out of balance uh, and then initialize as a dam break problem. But these are done more for, for modeling the down flume dynamics. Oh. Anyway, um, actually, this is not the movie I wanted to show. That they're uh, a group of uh, they're actually mathematicians, but somehow coincidentally also working in this area of particle size segregation, where flows like this can can segregate different size particles, and that's what uh, uh, is very characteristic about these debris flows is that the coarse particles rapidly get transported to the front and they form levees uh, and they form a bulky front at the at the uh, front of the flow and that retards the flow in some sense because the pore fluid pressure can't stay high in that material because it, it's too permeable um, so a lot of these flows are are somewhat uh, steered in a sense by these levees and this bulk bulky front formation and that's that's essentially probably the most important piece of physics that's missing from our model is this segregation of particle size distribution. But it turns out it, uh, it can be 
modeled by a hyperbolic system, the particle size segregation itself, um, which has some interesting properties. So our, our next, uh, one of the directions we're going is to couple that into our model. Uh, so this is of that experiment, just downstream depth and poor fluid pressure. The shaded here is aggregated data from, from many flume experiments that are, were tried to, that, that were uh, run in an attempt to be uh, exactly the same each time. And the, the, so this is depth here as a time series at 32 meters down flume. That's the uh, simulation. Uh, and this is poor fluid pressure at that same location. So the results, we think given the crudeness of the model, are, are, are at least reasonable. Uh, you know, I forgot to show, I think on last week I showed the Mount Meager debris flow simulations. So that's using this model for, for a large scale real debris flow. But so to, to close, uh, the idea of showing this uh, at a tsunami meeting is that uh, it's possible to couple these depth average models. So for instance, a landslide, a, a submarine landslide or a subaerial that goes into the water could be modeled independently of the tsunami and then coupled unidirectionally into the tsunami through using this D-topo idea. Uh, but better than that would be to use some sort of two-layered model where one truly couples the landslide and the tsunami propagation using for the tsunami either shallow water equations or maybe a dispersive model since landslide-induced tsunamis tend to be on shorter length scales. But one could still use a uh, depth average two-layer model for that. Uh, the other uh, topic that makes debris flows relevant for this is, is that if you've seen the inundation fronts for the tsunami in Japan, and it's not water at all, it's a debris flow essentially, at least in many areas. So another idea might be to couple together the granular fluid model uh, and use it near inundation fronts. So just as sort of closing thoughts, uh, always consider the, the possibility of numerical artifacts uh, or instabilities in numerical solutions. Sometimes they can look like physical phenomenon, but they're, they're not at all. Uh, in fact, many papers have been written on, on interesting physical uh, phenomenon that in the end turned out to be nothing but numerical artifact. Uh, so validate, verify, uh, compare results, and share code.